How, how's things, John? Th thanks very much for joining me. How have you been? Not too bad now, thank God. You know, it's like everything else. We're getting on with life. Hard times, good times, best of times and worst of times. That's how it is in life here now. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to open up by asking, um, I, I was reading an article about you and it said that you own an art gallery in an area that, that you used to bomb, actually, ironically enough. Yes, but what, what the crack is there, right? I, I had an art gallery in Scott Street. I no longer have that one. Just working here in Preferences. And uh, I was interviewed by people in America. I think they were from what they called the Massachusetts, from the University of Massachusetts. And I'd done that interview with them, you know? And uh, that was done also many years ago. So it was in, just after the ceasefires, I think, not too long. I can't remember how long ago it was. And they checked us up on YouTube, yes. And uh, they asked me about how things had changed. And I tried to present to them just how much had changed as a result of the ceasefires and the, the, the ensuing peace. And yet it is, it is a relative peace at all times here in the North, like everything else, because we still have the political situation. But it's peace, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it, allows for a lot, it has allowed for a lot of things. There's been massive changes that seem to take place since the days of, them, you know, of that, what do you call it, uh, interview. You understand? So, yeah. Uh, the area I was in was Scott Street in Armagh and it was one of the most bombed streets in Armagh because it was, mainly, it was predominantly unionist and there was a lot of all factors. The, the provisional IRA at that time, which, which I was never a member of the provisional IRA, I was a member of the official IRA at the time and later on with the Irish National Liberation Army, which I'm a founding member. Ironically, it's uh, 50 years old now. 50 years on the go uh, this year, the INLA. It's the anniversary of the INLA, 50 years ago. When we formed it in 1974. And uh, there's a whole story there because we were in jail at the time of when we split from the official IRA to form the INLA. So a lot has changed since 1974. In fact, it was in December 1974 that the INLA was Firstly, are formally established in the uh, in Long Cash, where we were prisoners held at the time. However, you know, my my involvement goes back to way back in the late sixties. At the time, and then the Battle of Bogs had the, the early part of the troubles, and uh, I became involved as a youngster, fourteen years of age and fifteen. Involved in a lot of civil disobedience, a lot involved in resistance, um, in terms of building barricades, learn how to make Molotov cocktails, and being involved in rats and and uh, more or less there was a that was the everyday way of life at that time, and it was very hard not to become involved um, as a youngster. So a lot of influences, you know, a lot of political influences. We don't come from a member of a Republican family, like most people in them days. They didn't really come from big Republican families. Uh, they became Republican because of the situation. For many people, it was just a matter of opposing the Unionist Orange regime in the North and all the, the what they call it, uh, all the mechanisms of oppression including the State Police Force, the RUC, and the State Paramilitary Police Force at that time, known as the Beast Battles, a 99% paramilitary organisation, mainly a 99% Protestant paramilitary organisation, funded and armed and trained by the states, who were, at the best, our, our, our neighbours, so you can imagine how it was the situation growing up in 1969. On my first night, on the, oh, sorry, on the night of August the 14th, in 1969, the first man in the troubles, John Gallagher, was shot dead on the streets of Armagh by the Beast Bastards, who came in, much like the KKK, in their own cars, in their own uniforms, and with their own rifles and wobblies. And they came in in ordinary civilian cars, they were masked, and they were determined to 
quell any voice of resistance or any uh, action that threatened the northern state. And basically they were there to defend the northern Protestant state and northern Union state. And they opened up without warning and I dare say even without any orders, they opened up on the people and they shot three men, two men were wounded and one man, John Geller, a young man with a young family was shot dead, totally unarmed, totally innocent. In fact, he wasn't even involved in the trouble that night. He was going from one bar to another to have a drink with his mates. So there you go. And that was my involvement. We all became involved. And throughout the whole of the 60s, where I lived, I lived in a place called Dromarg, which is a very staunch Republican area and remained so throughout the Troubles. And uh, therefore, the resistance... After that, the resistance against the Northern State, the, the, the Orange State, increased you know, rapidly and it increased effectively. And throughout the whole of the North and the South, I, mean, I, I don't want to give you a lecture on the troubles, on the troubles but I just want to outline how it affected us in Armagh. Oh, you're grand, you're grand. After John Gallo was shot dead, three or four young people were shot dead as well by the Beast Bashers and by the OU. See, so we knew that uh, civil resistance, and civil disobedience alone was not going to be it. Was not going to be the only way to confront and to resist. And everybody knew that at somewhere along the line, the weapons would come onto the scene, and and, and that's basically how it was. You know, there was a Republican group there. The Republican movement in Armagh and elsewhere at the time was fairly thin on the ground and they still had weapons and arms and various and ordnance as well. But uh, they had and they, they, they had organized as best they could with what they had, we could and then of course acquired more weapons. We uh, joined, people in my generation joined Nafi and Earn, which is it's been described as a youth wing of the IRA, and to some extent it is, but Nafina Earn is a lot more than that. There, this is not a Boy Scout troop. You know, you don't learn how to. What uh, a tie knots and shit. Yeah. To use firearms, weapons, and ordnance, and Boy Scouts. So when we joined Nafina Earn, it became more formalized and regulated. Our resistance and. And so on. It was pretty normal. It was um, in 1972, after the Bloody Sunday, the ranks of both the Provisional IRA and the Official IRA and anyone else for that matter. Just, uh, what do you call it? It swelled, yeah. Massive increase and massive popular. You know, when people realize that after me, people being innocent, made people being shot down on the streets have died, that the only way to resist it was through armed struggle. Basically, that was it. And people trained for it. And I was one of the ones who was involved, who was trained for this year. Okay, so I'm getting used to this now. Yeah, okay. So, so we, okay, so yeah, we, you, you, you were talking there about your, your joining of the youth wing. I might take us back a little bit. And what, what year were you born? And what was it like? Uh, what was it like growing up um, in 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 Armagh City uh, pre previous to to this conflict breaking out? Well, lucky for my generation that we did experience uh, life before the troubles, and you know it was very much a pretty normal. Growing up in the sixties, you had the whole cultural change, you know, and music and everything else, and all the Beatles, the Stones, and all that culture and music and everything was changing. And all and in Mark, you had of course. The the black, the the black rats, you know, the black people's rioting and everything else. The Martin Luther King and the oppression, and all these were all part of the whole situation. But it was peaceful where we were in Armagh and Calix and Protestants mixed together. There was always tension. It was, it was under the surface, a wee bit buried under the surface, but it was always there, and uh, especially around the twelfth of July. And uh, I mean, the, the whole basis for what happened lies goes back to 1924 without having to go into history till the, the, the what do you call it, the partition of 
this island. No, you're grand. Um, you're grand. What was laid out for us was laid out a long, long time ago. And we were as much the victims of history, especially our generation. And we, we lost a lot of our generation, either through jails, imprisonment, through uh, being shot dead, or whatever, for whatever reason. I mean, the whole generation was lost there in many, many years. Nobody thought at the time in 1969 that this uh, conflict would last as, as it did for nearly 30 years. There's no one could have had an idea. But I remember my father saying to me at John Gallagher's funeral, and he was a very quiet man, non-political, hard worker, rare 12 of us in a house, three-bedroom house. And this is my dad's outlook, and he says, you know, at the time for a young fellow listening to him that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and that's what's going to happen. And you know what it did? And that was his basic way. You know, we just know any working class man was saying things. This is not going to end. This is going to go on. But no one could have foreseen at the time it was going to go on for 30 years or almost. And I certainly did not foresee that I would ever end up in jail, that I would ever end up lying naked in the cell for four years, putting my excrement on the wall. And neither did I believe that I, I could never have envisaged that I would be Spent 12 of the best years of my life in jail. I would be shot by the British Army. But my mate would be shot as well. Die alongside me, my best mate. And buried on his 18th birthday. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the hunger strikes in 1980. I was on the first hunger strike. Sad was myself and six other men. And uh, that lasted 53 days. In which we all were near... Uh, uh, death's door, so to say. And it was uh, a lot of suffering and pain. And if you had said that to me, this is how it's going to be in 1969, I would have thought you were mad. I just said, it's impossible. But it did happen. And, and eventually, when it all came to an end, come to an end, I had received the last rites three times from three different priests as a result of the conflict. So I have a lot of scars from gunshot wounds and battle wounds and uh, a lot of trauma. I, I suffer from PTSD as a result of a lot of beatings, which I received within the prison. And uh, getting beaten when you're naked is a novel thing. Uh, it is, this is Guantanamo, long before Guantanamo. And uh, a lot of people suffered really harsh treatment, endured terrible harsh brutality and treatment at the hands of the prison regime and certain types of uh, prison or screws becoming prison officers who were bigoted, not just bigoted, they hated you. It's a bit like the, what they call Israelis holding the Palestinians. Can you, if you make that comparison? And um, that's how it with us. However, my involvement in the troubles going back, I became involved, I... I and I became actively involved in uh, but the, but then was known as the first layer I did a lot of my friends at the time, a lot of my old friends became involved in the provisional area. And just to go back now, quite a lot of bombing and shootings were taking place by the nineteen seventy two and more so after uh, Bloody Sunday. And the whole thing just went per shape all again. Resistance increased. It just uh, Unbelievably, uh, how would you say, it? affected all the, the nearly all the fabric of all our lives. And uh, this conflict and troubles, the fight against the British Army, the fight against the OEC, the OEC Reserve, uh, the fight against the Ulster Defence Department, which is just a replacement of the notorious Beast Brussels, and who have done quite a lot of damage, the UDR and the OEC, uh, against. I mean, we're talking about raids every day, people being interned without trial, helicopters in the air every day, gun battles nearly every other day, bombings. That's that street you mentioned in Scar Street, one of the most bombed places in, in the county of Armagh. And uh, as was a lot of the whole town was bombed as well, you know. And uh, looking back and reflecting now, you can see there's a lot of anger in people. And I think myself, you know, it, they were just striking out and heading out at anything and anyone that they thought had been responsible for all the years of oppression 
anything that was unionist and so on. I don't like to use sectarian terms. I'd rather use political terms in this case, even though in many ways it did there was an underlying element of sectarianism. You know? So we became involved and we uh, we trained in weapons and we 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 were trained in weapons and ordnance and explosives and stuff like that there. And maybe I don't know how many hundreds, maybe thousands of people throughout the north and the south were actually going through the same process. I mean, the whole island the whole the whole island was affected by the troubles. So I mean it's all there to be read and seen about or sorry, viewed now of everything that happened. But for me and I do speak on behalf of most of my generation is that we were caught up in something that we did not fully understand at 14, 15 years of age. Of course. And yeah. we, we, we went out on the civil rights marches. We attended all the vigils. No, maybe, can you imagine a young fellow at 15 now seeing thousands and thousands of people out on the streets marching for one man, one vote? I imagine, hard to believe, one man, one vote, a simple demand. And then for other rights and stuff they got there and how it all spiraled out of hand and how it was all, uh, the repression from the Union's regime was just unbelievable and in your face. And there was no other choice, but for many people like ourselves who became recruited, I got recruited into the various Republican factions and, 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 uh, and became involved in the military struggle. Could I, could I take you back to, um, to those like civil disturbances that you took part in before yeah. before you were ever a member of, of like the youth wing did you feel how how did it feel doing it did, did, did you feel like you were like an oppressed person who was fighting back against uh sort oh, of surely, yeah sure oh, you did like like as a kid as a kid did you did you kind of get what you were doing or or, or was it just a case of kind of going along with with, with, with what our, the, our, were doing? yeah well, our, our education was simply a street education. We, we, we weren't born about ideologies and neither were we uh, too concerned about the deep analysis of what lay behind the, off, the onset of the troubles and the conflict. And uh, what we seen was naked oppression on our streets coming from the likes of, the, 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 but, but we called the Crown Forces. It was a broad name for all the forces who were there to uh, prop up and, and protect uh, the orange uh, regime in Stormont at the time. We were determined to... I mean, you had to remember the situations like every day you woke up and there's men being... houses being raided, rats fighting, hand-to-hand fight. i never seen hand-to-hand fighting in my life till I was about 16 years of age, 17. And it's a frightening thing to see hand-to-hand fighting. F- uh, sorry, fighting in a big way to see much older men. But you thought at the time, but these were only men who were in the late twenties, early thirties, but when you're young. So what we seen, you know, we emulated too as well. You know, we, we became more organized as a result of our involvement in, say, for example, in Republican structures. You understand? You're more disciplined, more organized, and you're following orders as well to a bigger extent. And there's also more confidence, the fact that if you were given direction and so on. The politicization, the education, that all came later. But what you were responding to was the negative person that you experienced yourself and seen for yourself. So you didn't need an education and anything to tell you what was going wrong here. And you didn't have to have a big uh, purchase, a, a, a very deep purchase on Irish history or Irish Republican history for that matter. It was all there laid out burr every single day of your life and you met up and you, and you became part of it, you became engulfed or in, in, involved in some way or another and that's how it was. So, I mean, I remember when the bombs started going off and hearing the first bombs and, uh, you know, we, we'd never heard this here before, we'd never even seen it and this became almost a, not an everyday thing but a, a regular occurrence and you would hear these bombs going off and it became part and parcel of the whole thing. But you knew it had reached a different level when you heard, the, and especially the gun battles. I mean, in the estate I lived in, the real working class hardline area, 
uh, gun battles every night. Not every night, well, most nights, and during the day. Name of the estate, excuse me? Yeah. What was the name of the estate? Sorry to interrupt. I Drummarg, D R U M A R G. There's quite a lot about Drummarg, you know, in the, in the media. From names, there's no barricades were up, no go warriors. Well, uh, the uh, order of the day, barricades had to be manned, defended, you know, and at the same time, you know, uh, the provisional area and others were actually training ordinary people uh, in weapons and defense tactics, you know, and all those things. People who were not actually involved, but were given remedial training in weapons just in case, you know, because there was always the, the uh, threat of being invaded by the RUC more and more. But this was all part of the whole cyber, the whole, the whole. Uh, upsurge the whole insurgent uh, activities that we all became involved in. Okay. So you, know, you were gathering intelligence too. This is one of the first things you do is you learn how to gather intelligence, what to look for, what to pinpoint, um, what be what they call it, car registrations, types of cars, models, stuff like that there, who's in them, where and where. You learn all this, what they call intelligence gathering, and it's not just simply going out and walking about. You, you, quite a lot of all things would be come into play. What all people seen were and when, you know. So there was a whole sort of what they call bulk of intelligence being gathered up on a almost day and daily basis as to what the movements of the, what they call it, the, the crown forces were at and so on. And in order to plan attacks on them, you had to know exactly, <clears throat> you had to have the wherewithal the weapons for starters, the people trained, because these were ordinary, ordinary people. These aren't professionally trained soldiers who are paid and professionally trained and armed and everything. Oh, these are ordinary boys taking out weapons, you know, and having to go out and fight against the professional army. And you can imagine what, what it's like, you know what I mean? We were well equipped and well armed, helicopters, sarsons, saladins, you name it, against, thrown against, or pitted against ordinary working class people who all they had was whatever was at their uh, whatever was available at their hands and that's through stones, iron stone, riding, paddle bombs, cocktails, molotovs, uh, grenades, sometimes grenades and sometimes uh, what do you call them? Uh, pipe bombs and it's not a factor but that, that, this thing had escalated Totally from 1969, like a prairie fire, it had spread throughout the whole fabric of uh, of the, the, the six counties, in particular, but throughout all. So we, we became involved, simple as that. There. We ended up in jail. I was shot in 1973 by the British Army at close range on a place called Women Hill. And the army maintained our alleged that. That we we had engaged them in a gun battle, and that there was four men involved, or three men more. And uh, and the night I was shot, we were shot at close range by the British Army, the Royal Regiment, the Fusiliers in particular, who were very much active in the city at the time against the the, the Repub all the Republican forces. So. Uh, and that I was shot close to range, no attempt to capture us, just shot a point blank range at, say, 20 yards, not even 20 yards, a high velocity rifle with an outside. And uh, my mate was the first Republican casualty. They called him Jim McGarrigan. And uh, Jim was young father, the same age as myself, a couple of months young, older than me. So uh, the harsh reality of the troubles was that this young fellow, Shot down, and I mean, it's hard to describe the situation that night. I we fell beside me. I was hit too, two of us, and uh, you know you can imagine the the gore and the, the the whole blood and the fear and the terrible damage that was done to first of all my intestines, but he was hitting an artery and bleeding couldn't, couldn't get the bleeding stopped, even though people came out of their houses. And nearby to the scene, 
to try and help him get a tourniquet, tourniquet on and stuff like that. But the horse we all had troubles came to my life when he was buried, in his, buried on his 18th birthday. It was um, it was the same bullet that killed him that hit, hit you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they, they weren't aiming for me at the time. I didn't discover this until the trial. They charged me, okay, I was charged with possession of firearms and tent. did nothing on me whatsoever. No forensics, no weapons. They had no... Uh, I had witnesses to say who came out of their houses, who, were, who went to court, for example, and said that they didn't see any weapons about and so on. You understand? And this is how the case was, right? but it didn't matter. Uh, there had been a gun battle that night between the First IRA and the British Army, the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, whom they had engaged before, and who later off, uh, as Matali Houston for, Chief McGagan, and then the next day, two days later, another a First IRA volunteer was shot dead at close range, a fella called Tony Hughes. He was only 19, and... Uh, Shortly after that, there, and I was still myself in the hospital in, in Musgrave Park Military Wing, which was an army hospital under Harry Guard. The, the first area planted the first ever bomb inside uh, a notorious barge known as Golf Barge. It was the main military citadel in, in Armagh, it still has been there for a couple of hundred years. But uh, first area at that time were able to gain access to a car of a worker who worked in the barracks and used that there to facilitate a bomb being planted right in the middle of the barracks. So this was this is the type of you know, uh, situation in which I become now familiar. And uh, while I was in Mus while I was in Musgrave Park multi ring an attempt was made in my own life by soldiers who were there because they yeah but then they were getting treated for wounds and Actually, a couple of them soldiers died while I was there, and so on. So I had to be guarded by about three or four different, what they call it, no, uh, soldiers, different day and night, because I was taken to Musgrave Park Military Ring, and ironically, it was a military surgeon who operated me and was able to save my life. But uh, initially, it was a civil, uh, what they call it, a a civil servant, sorry, a civil surgeon, civilian surgeon. We don't know what, but there you go. I mean, here we are starting off. I'm moving 69 to here I am being shot at 18, at 17 years of age. Mate down beside me, another mate being shot dead two days later. And the guy who was with me, Jake McGagan, he was given a full military funeral, as was. To get the volunteer who was shot there the next day, Tony Hughes, while well, giving full military funerals. And there's a monument in Armagh now, now all these years on, 52 years on, say, whatever it is, 51. And that monument is still still there and is attended every year or two as a commemoration. So uh, anyway, I end up in jail, I end up in the uh, Sorry, could I, could, I, could, I, mm -hmm. could I take it back one second there, just, just before we get to Go ahead, go ahead there, John. Um, okay, so you, you mentioned you were in the in the youth wing. Um, can you describe like your mentality at the time? Like if someone, if one of your one one of your higher ups in the you know in that organization had asked you to to shoot and kill, uh, would would you have been prepared to do that at, at that stage around 16, 17 years old? But I don't think you would have any choice because you were a member, right? And you knew what you joined for, you understand? And it wasn't that such. You were there to protect your community, protect. Your, no, this was about uh, the concept of achieving a 32 country democratic social republic at that time was, uh, you know, pan, it was just, it was all what they call it, uh, how would you say? It was all words, you understand what I mean? the reality but you weren't worried about that you were out there to protect your community your families and and to protect to uh, fight against the state that was a, carrying out the worst forms of oppression you could ever believe you know and it was happening all over the world too as well at the time but uh, 
certainly, no matter what, if you join up any organisation, whether it be First Area, NLA, Professionals, and you become a member, and you're sworn in, and you accept the principles, and are taught the principles, rules, and regulations of that organisation, in terms of obeying orders, then you know what you're signing up for. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. And you have to accept that there. And you have to, and you, you're told also, I know I was in many others, that involvement requires a lot of sacrifice, a lot of pain and suffering in many cases, imprisonment, loss of liberty we uncaught, and death. Okay, either death at the hands of the Crown Forces or any member of them, of loyalist paramilitaries who would be instigated and controlled by the Crown Forces. So you became hyper sensitive and hyper aware that you are now in the front line with your comrades. And it was also very much a collective effort on everything. It wasn't a do it alone. So if you're sent out to engage uh, for patrol the British Army or to engage in an assassination, you know, it's not just someone coming up and telling you and say, this is what you have to do. This is all pre-planned, worked out. You know, some actions were spontaneous and reactionary, but in most cases, uh, the commanders or the leaders within whatever group you're you know, affiliated to will choose their men to do whatever type of job is necessary for what they can do. There's, there's horses for cautious, even in revolutionary activity. You got me? Okay, so um, when you when you first went to prison, at, at that stage, were, were you a member of the official IRA or still the... the, the... Well, I was a member, a member of the official IRA. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um. Uh. uh what. What was your. What was your sentence for falsely. Um. Being falsely accused of. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I sentenced to five years, which was a fairly low sentence because, and I didn't have a chance. The judge at that time. Uh, Gibson, who was later, assassinated by the provisionals, him and his wife, for some of the scurrilous remarks he made against Republicans while in the court, for example, after an inquest into area volunteers who had been shot dead without no just were just blatantly shot and assassinated. This judge Gibson, a former military man who had fought in the Second World War. And he, for example, it says that these people who were murdered by the British Army had been sent to the highest courts of justice. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. This was the judge that found me guilty against all odds. No no evidence and nothing. Nothing whatsoever. It was unbelievable. Despite the fact it was my ward plus four witnesses on my behalf against the ward of three soldiers. So it doesn't matter. I sat in the five years and I ended up. And then when I went into the jail in February 1974. No, this is, yeah, February 1974. Long cast have been there from October or from August 1971, and new cages and all have been built to accommodate a, a, an increasing number of you know, people coming into the jails, by the for attorneys or for those who were sentenced. So I went into the compounds, with, I was compound 21, there were 22 compounds. You can imagine the size of it like a city. 22 compounds. In each compound, there's three nesting huts, four, sorry. Four in Essendon House, three for accommodation, another for eating, you know. So, I, I by 1974, there was 22 compounds in operation filled with internees, people charged with their trial, or, with, you know, for no reason, but in this, which is in turn with their trial. I was going to say, we're, we're recording this, we're recording this podcast on the 9th, which is actually the day that, um, that Operation Demetrius, the 9th of August, that was the day that Operation Demetrius um, was was kicked off here. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, I end up in jail as a result of having fought the trial. I'd been out in bail. I could, I could have run any time. I could have went to America. In fact, the offer was made to me 
Would they like to go to America and start afresh instead of have to face the trial? And I chose to face the trial because I fully believed that I could, when he caught, beat this here charge and that I was in a good position to do so. But it was, I think it was foolish looking back now and reflecting, it was foolish in that I didn't have a chance. These were non jury courts. This was a single judge, and him was a full prime member of the Unionist Ascendancy, as well as the British military with his background and everything else and all, you know. And this was this repeated throughout the whole of the whole court system in 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 dealing with what he called people who were active. And uh, I mean it was known as the conveyor belt system. You were just brought in, you were charged, uh, allegations that you had made statements were made against you. Totally and not a different lies. It was none these people were fabricating everything and they're getting away, but they had carte blanche to do whatever they wished to do in the course because I mean the whole state was in turmoil. It was being ripped apart and they were there to guard it. So they're prepared to do anything. So uh, anyway, that's how I became involved. And my brother, he was involved too. He uh he was convicted of shooting a UDR man and received uh, him and three hours received 18 years. Very, very high sentence. It's not a time, you know. And uh, so you can see how it was affecting the family. This is now my brother is, is in with me now and all, you know, and other people I knew. I mean, I, I could look, and look, look at all the other kids and there was hardly a kid in which it was someone I did not know. Um, okay, so given, given given that you would later go on to um to protest and hunger strike for um special category status, um it, it's uh, the the first time you went into prison, you 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 guys had um essentially essentially kind of prisoner of war status, right? Oh yes, we we had at that time political status and everything else. The compounds and uh, all, all the compounds had their own command staff. It was well organized, you know what I mean? And much the same as they've done down through the years, whether it be Frank Gock, whether it be what it, the Argenta, whether it be uh, what they call Mount Joy or Cumber Road Jail, you know. Republicans always had their sort of what they call, you know, either a de facto or de jure form of uh, you know, control and over over their 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 men. And uh, in 1972, after a hunger strike, Political status was awarded by, I think it was a uh, white. What do you call him? I uh, can't remember the name of the secretary of state. White law, uh, William White law. Like Billy White law, yeah, Billy White law. And uh, after that, there were the cages, and the compounds were built down at Long Cash, which was formerly a British army, World War Two British army. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Airplane, an airfield, an airfield wasn't it? Aerodrome. It was an aerodrome. But it was beside Lisbon, and Lisbon, of course, is the capital of Unionist quarters in the north. If everything in Madame within the military happened, and it was, will all be traced back to Lisbon, which was their headquarters. And I uh, can't remember the name of the, the exact barracks, but it was notorious you not know, for a lot of the torture and Madonna and everything else. You know, and people like myself, you know, too. For example, let me give you one example. Bally Kelly was another camp, military camp, and it's, it's in the County Derry. And the RUC, British Army, and Special Branch started arresting all the young people who they thought were involved and who weren't involved. In other words, you're trying to shake out the bag to see who come back and come out. And they arrested loads of people, taking them into helicopters, first take them to golf barracks. And there they're held in golf barracks, and very intimidatory and suppre uh, oppressive uh, conditions and, and the environment in itself to frighten the special. We were all very much young at the time. But then we were brought by helicopter. We were... Uh, all of us were handcuffed inside the helicopters. As for me, I, I must have been a bit different because I was helicopter. I was handcuffed to the seat, one of the seats in the helicopter. 
However, and we're threatened to, they're threatened to throw you out on the way over the spurring mountains, so we're heading to uh, over to Bally Kelly. And then most people spent about three to four days in Bally Kelly and went through an awful uh, regime to, of being beaten and being uh, deprived. Sensory sans- deprivation was unbelievable. You're put into one of the, the tactics you use was to put you into a small cellular type room, no windows in it. So I just one little small window, but it was all painted black as well as the scene on the floor. Everything was painted black. And it and you were there and all you had was a, a mattress and a blanket, so water. But you can imagine what the conditions were like, you know, it was just unbelievable. And then you were taken out, maybe interrogated, interrogated two or three times a day for three days, the time to break you down. So uh, I know it, it didn't break me anyway. I know that for a fact because at that time, I had become fairly hardened. You understand? I was a different man than I was at 15, 16 years of age. I had seen it all quite a lot. And I'd seen people being shot dead, killed, tortured. I'd heard all the stories. That This was now becoming like norm. Um, if, if you don't mind me asking, and not going to any specifics, but um, at that stage, had you, um, had you engaged in maybe any shooting... Killing, possibly. Yeah, well, I mean, all of us had been involved in so many different things. Well, it could be, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to in, in, uh, point out any names of any people at all as to who was involved. But we all became involved in whatever was happening at the time, and you know, uh, that's but that's why you joined up for it. I mean, if you weren't there, you need to get out. You're not. You're not capable. It's not, it's not your scene. And this is these are just ordinary populous, ordinary people, everyday people. You're 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 backing on to support you, you're, you're backing on to uh, give you helps, not just help, but to, to keep you keep you alive in many ways, and also to keep you in freedom. However, uh, we all became at one time and all involved in activities. There's no doubt about that there. And it was way out of our league as young fellas of seven, 16, 17. I look now and I see young people of 16, 17, 18. And I see them now as a guy who's now hitting 70 next year. And I look at them and I think to myself, oh my God, I was that age. And of course you don't see yourself at that age, at that time. It's only as time goes by and the experience of life kicks in all the time and you start to realise and you start to compare as to where were you to, to, to where you were in your life. And I would look back and I say 17 and I see all my young nephews and my nieces at eight, 17, 18, 19. And you realise how young we all were. So we're taking out of a situation. Next thing you find yourself, you were trained in weapons we the explosives. And at that time, you know, it was any type of weapon was available. You trained on it. You understand? It wasn't that you had like a the British Army sort of what they call it, a standardized weapons, you know, and stuff like that. There, you just had to. This is all what happened, you know, and that was a uh, par for the course on more or less than our in, in them areas which I lived in. Okay, so and you've seen attacks being carried out to you. It's actually witness attacks. And you can see men, you know, boys that you have known went to school with them being asked. And next thing they're out and they're dressed up in sort of uh, camouflage gear and carrying weapons, rifles, machine gun. I remember they're going, they're planting a bomb. And these are people that you've grown up with and known and everything else and all. And you realise that now that life is never going to be the same. Okay, so uh, when when was it? When was it that you uh, were released from jail from your first sentence? And how long were you out until until um, until your your later uh, imprisoning? I was released on the tenth of July, nineteen seventy six. Two and a yep. half years after I done the only we just at that time we we got we had managed to win fifty percent remission of our time. Right? No, uh, but meant that people done. People up until that done two thirds of a sentence, okay. 
and this was reduced to 50%, but only for a short while. Soon ended that. There was a model of appeasement at the time. However, I got out two and a half years later. And when I came out of long cash, I certainly wasn't the same person I, I, I was when I went then. First of all, I was a much better educated person. And not just political education or ideological or anything like that, or in terms of even what he called academic, you know, and self education. Because I used my time personally and for per you know, there was extrinsic and intrinsic value to whatever education you got, whether it be academic, political, or whatever. And extrinsic and it would value it would uh, enhance your struggle the struggle and also your greater political awareness. And then we realised too it's a whole inter international dimension that there. And then we moved away from Nazist politics into Marxist politics, into Leninism. And we studied there for a long, long time. I mean, I was in a library. Our library had 11 tomes or 11 volumes of Matsya Tung's work. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> yeah, right. It's big, right? Very, very leftist, right? And very Marxist. I mean, okay, we met, but none of you was holding Dad's Capital in their hands. To read it, you understand, but uh, they would have read colonies, labor. No, it was localized, it was nationalized too, in terms of colony. But very, we had a very, very left wing and international uh dimension to our struggle, first and foremost. Where I said, provisions were very nationalistic at the time, but we looked beyond colony, we looked beyond Mallows, and we looked towards Guevara, and we looked towards Fidel, and we actually established good relations with the Cubans. At that time in 1974-75, and uh, through the uh, a lot of things we had become a lot a lot closer to uh, the Cuban regime or authorities or um, people would have understood and knew. However, this is what differentiated us from the provisional IRA in that we, if their if if their uh, symbolism was. Uh, an Easter lily, or it was a, what he called some sort of nationalist type symbol. Ours was international and was a red star. So with our brats, he would have wore an Easter lily, but our icons are, are what do you call it, iconic. All the different icons we used were all very international, and the red star was the most prominent. Interesting. So you, can imagine, you can imagine, and you went through a very military regime in, in there. You had your command officer, your two ICs, they called no second command, but we used them all in, our, in the Irish language. And then you had your staff brigade, and then they were responsible to our side, and we were connected to our people outside directly uh, and interacted with them directly and indirectly so that we felt. And we are still part of the whole struggle, even though we're isolated and contained and controlled. You understand? It was right. all part of our identity. So we were different in that there, in the respect in that uh, our education system was orientated towards internationalism and towards socialism, to some degree, Marxist, Leninist, big element of that there, and Trotskyist. We learned all the different differentiations between the different ideologies. So we became educated, and what you what you uh, what's happening here is probably uh, the most important things. The most important developments in trouble is that you know the old that old saying, "Separate the silver from the dross." All right. Did we hear that there, silver? You know, a good workman will separate the silver. From the dross. And that simply means that the people inside were such nice volunteers who were committed, who were focused and targeted for education, for the role that they're going to maintain when they get back out again. So you hadn't really left the struggle just because you were in jail. You were still very much a part of it. You were still very much involved in, in that whole sort of, you know, you were there, you were very. Very important dots to make to, to join up. We were, you were very important. And, however, what you seen was a 
different type of volunteer now being formulated. A bit like I see a blacksmith doing, you know, and that the men who are coming out, better educated, better trained, hardened, yeah, yeah, yeah and have been through the whole uh, process of cadre ship. You know, the word cadre is cadre, you understand? And that was a lot different from the gut reaction people who, who went out on the streets in 1971-72 after internment. And what you seen then was through the processes within the jails, and without the jails, a refining of a type of volunteer, a more committed, less gut reaction volunteer, but someone who could well-rounded in every aspect of what was happening and more dedicated and commitment. Right, I, I can I can imagine being um being in prison would would, would very much be a, a radicalizing thing, yeah, for sure. Can, can you well um... radicalizing is that yeah? Plus the discipline. Every day you're up uh, at a certain time, nine o'clock, exercise, and then breakfast is very militaristic, and then you're out on parade, and drilling. You understand in groups, all out there, all, and all around you. Try and remember. British Army, British Army checkpoints, British Army pillar boxes, guns, weapons, dogs, all that whole paraphernalia of containment and control that was used by the, the, the British forces, by the British government to keep you in there. It didn't always work because the first I was involved in the very first mass escape uh, out of Longcash, the very first successful mass escape was carried out by the NLA. And that happened in around about May 1975, when we got 10 men out. Uh, as a result of a, toggle, a tunnel we had uh, dug and which we had engineered to, uh, to get... The, the whole thing was uh, very important. It was a cycle, a major cycle as you blow in that People thought that this was the top, and it was maintained that it was the top security, most secure jail in the world. But when I was down uh, in the tunnel with all the rest of us, and digging away, and pl I was on the escape committee, and the end of the day, after so many days, I think it was maybe after 20 days, we had finally got the tunnel finished, complex, massive undertaking, so it was, uh, we got 10 men out. And these were all, first of all, good for our morale, good for our confidence, and also uh, showed the, the, the regime outside and inside the prison of what we were now capable of and the way this had now all orientated into a whole different type of struggle. And this 1972, 73 and 74 some of the worst years of the troubles. And when oh. they, made, they, became, they became involved straight away. Did, when they made an escape. Did, did you say did you say you, you personally you personally got out with them? No. You you, you wouldn't have been released. Oh, no, I, I, I had only so many I had most of my time completed. You know, Stan? This was May nineteen seventy five, right? I only about a year ago, no June. I was I came out in July, you know, the following year. And uh, it was boys with long sentences doing life sentences. 18 years, and those who were going to be most effective, there was a choice, there was a, a packing order, if you were, as to who was going to get out first, you know what I mean? So, for example, uh, the NLA at that time were very much an effective operation, both inside and outside the jail. And I think one of the things that distinguishes, distinguishes ourselves from all the other groups that primarily was, there was a focus on retaliating against the uh, Lyrless collaborators and lyrless murder gang members, and we, we concentrated against them. And, and in fact, we did go out and we did kill them. Mm. Hi there, John. I've been sure. sort of a bit hazard here, and in, in, in the chronology, it's hard to what do you call it? No, stay at one point to explain another point. I'm not going in a chronological sequence oh, that's, here. That's grand. I'll, I'll, I'll keep yes. it. I'll keep it. I'll, I'll keep it on track that way. Yeah, yeah. You can add it down to it, no, yourself. Like, no, you know? I, I, I probably won't even edit it. I'll just, I'll just, 
I'll just take it back. Yeah. I'll just take the conversation back. Okay, so so let me tell you. Uh, let, let me ask you about um about your joining of the INLA. It, it, it was in prison that you that you became a member. Yeah. Right? No, we formed the INLA in the prison and outside the prison. I was a founding member of the INLA. You understand? Okay. And right. what happened was the official IRA by this time in 1974 had made it clear that they had abandoned the armed struggle. They had abandoned a lot of things and moved uh, the whole sort of what they call it, the uh, political structures were my, very much Dublin orientated and not Northern orientated and they were just prepared to uh, ditch the whole armed struggle. It was just, it was a, a revolution betrayed, and there's actually a book by that name, Revolution Betrayed. You should look it up, because I have done an interview on it. I'll give you an insight to some of the stuff that I have said in that book about the split, because most of us were talking about the split here in 1974, in Saturday night. And in June 1974, the IRSP was formed by Seamus Coslow, some people call him Costello, but name was Costello. And uh, by other members who were discontented, deeply discontented by the strategy and tactics and so on, and the disabandonment of the armed struggle by the official IRA. And it was quite clear that by 1974, June, that we're not going to go back to any form of armed struggle. And thus, this led to a split in the movement a very uh, atrocious split too and a, a deadly division so as people end up getting killed and uh, that was uh, actually uh, all these feuds were devastating in terms of morale on each side and in terms of the, making the different organisations effective however we wanted to get on with the armed struggle and the NLA was formed very good. Um, okay, so how long? Um, sorry, how, how long were you free between between these two uh, prison sentences? And and what was your? Six months. Were, okay, so it was six, six months. Jeez. Okay, so uh, w when you when you came out of prison that first time, were you, were you straight back into into like active guerrilla duty? Was we'll it more or less? Uh, you, you don't you don't really leave. You understand? There's the continuity from 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 cage to. From, from the prison, if you don't really effectively leave that sort of what I call it, revolutionary mindset. It's just that we do come out, you see how the situation has changed in terms of, terms of logistics, in terms of um, types of strategies, and in terms of what they call the uh, military activity and stuff like that as well. You learn, in, and that has all changed, but uh, in, in, in your head, you're still living back at the time when you were sentenced. For example, I was sentenced in 1974. And to some degree, you know, jail may prepare you for a lot of things, but didn't prepare you for a lot of change. And you don't you don't fully realise or understand that an awful lot of things have changed in a couple, couple of two and a half years. So you're coming out in a situation where new tactics required, different type of personnel are required, the gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction, people are gone, and you're left with a hardened nucleus or anomaly of uh, people who are not only politically cadres, but uh, well-versed and well-equipped in the military uh, aspect of things. You understand what I'm saying? Could you um could you maybe I know it was a, it was a while ago, could, could you maybe characterize some of those some of those differences if you could just, just to give us a bit of an insight into it? A political difference between the uh, NLA and FSA, right? Uh, not so much political, maybe maybe like no. the, like like the way they operated. Um that, that that's more that's more interesting to me. At yeah. Least. yeah. Well, first of all, you know, the a greater emphasis on intelligence because I mean when a lot of men come into jail are debriefed. By their command, no, their, their, their but intelligent officers. You had the members. It's a whole staff. It's a whole command structure. It's a whole process to go through, and anybody coming in, whether turned or sentenced, or remanded, is debriefed about all the, about how they got there, in detail, 
and so on, and all this intelligence is sent back out, okay, into a certain quarter. And it's from this feedback that people start to understand more uh, the nature of, uh, how do you call it, the nature of how the British are operating, like there's a lot of intelligence, how the need the needs for change, and maybe you would have had the old unit structure. Now you had what was called in the NLA the cell structure, and the cell structure was very effective in that you could have maybe five men in a cell, not like in the, way back we had these battalions and you had all these it was all crazy stuff saying out there. But once you entered into the cell, but the cell uh, formations, very very important in that you uh, you close down any lines of uh, intelligence going to the British. Yeah, but what I mean is you, you were able to control who knew what at any time and who didn't know what. You understand? And so on. So the cell, we adopted the cell structure, which was very much in use in the international whether it be Bader Meinhof, or whether it be the Red Army, or whatever, it's, no, no, all that type of thing, but the sales structure was important. So that's just one change. The other was, uh, first of all, more politically aware, become more politically involved, and uh, you, you knew what your ideal was, you ended up what your objectives were, and what orientation you took in terms of uh, so on. But basically the fight was still against the, 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 the British regime in the North, against the uh, orange regime and storm in the north, you know, and all that whole apparatus of oppression, no matter what you'd lost it with. I was going to say, what, what I, I mean, given given the INLA had had like significantly less members than and the provisionals. Uh... Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But at that time in 1974, 75, the, I mean, uh, Initially, we were split within the compounds within Long Cash. There was 18 of us who split away from the official IRA. And we demanded our own compound, our own cage, so to say, our recognition as a group. And uh, eventually, after a short hunger strike and other activities, we got that official recognition. In other words, we attained political status like any other group. And there was only 18 at the start. And by summer... 1975, I think we had 50 to 60 men in the cage, in compound 14, which was the NLA cage. And then it went from compound 14, we went down to compound 5, from which we escaped from, planned escape. And prior to that escape, that big mass escape in 10 minutes, and now just prior to it, in 1975, we had got another five men out through an operation uh, carried out in the, the Belfast City Courts where the boys were able to find a way to manoeuvre. Uh, it was a big, big sort of stone that had been placed on the ceiling of each cell and we were able to manoeuvre that and, and get out. It's unbelievable how they done it. But anyway, that was five men out, very good for morale. We became a lot of prestige involved there. And then, of course, in the New Year's all prestige, we started to go for prestige targets, early Nave in particular. And, and we're, we're moving on to the troubles. And I'd like to deal with that aspect. I mean, no, maybe again, John, right? Uh, no, we're talking about yeah. I'm dealing with the compounds here and the national party and how I became involved and how others became involved, my friends, my and how we all became dedicated cadres and how we also became ruthless. You did become ruthless. You may never have been, but as a result of your training, experience, and uh, guided orientation, you know, you did, you became, uh, I mean, ruthless, not the word, but you were certainly uh, a lot more disciplined clear cut as to what your actions would lead to 
as to what was going to happen you, because it already did, and all that that entailed, all the sacrifices and things that that entailed, for you and your family, it might not just you, your family and all. And this is something about the compounds that people don't understand, that the British did not understand. For every one person in Long Cash, there was an average family of four or five outside. So if you had, at that time, say, 10,000 men and women in the jails, then multiply that by four or five. And that's how this was affected outside. It's a massive operation. Now it's organizing visits, family visits down to Long Cash, right to the very last detail of planning Easter parades and uh, cementing in all the gains that have been made and also formulating new strategies, formulating new policies, adapting and amending accordingly and holding your whole business down. And uh, anything, basically what we're doing is anything that was superfluous to need was just that. Got me? You, you mentioned... Um... You mentioned about becoming becoming more ruthless and kind of becoming more hardened. Would you at the time have? Well, would, you, would you have the time? Most, uh, the time you more extremely. As, would, would you describe yourself as like sectarian? Would, would you have had? Would, would you so, have described yourself as? Certainly, there like, was like, never any sect. No, and in, in our in our compound in our case, there was no room for sectarianism. And for example, when the provost uh, killed all those workers, Protestant workers, up at Bestbrook, uh, there was nobody there cheering in our compound. And we were very against the whole... We never would acknowledge the sectarian nature. Uh, sorry, we never orientated towards anything religiously sectarian because... By this time, a lot of the boys were communists anyway. Okay, interesting. What, what, um, you, you said that you were out for six months before getting your eventual much longer sentence. What um, what were you convicted of? And the, and the next one, the first, one I was the first one I was convicted of firearms with intent to endanger life. Okay? On all charges. And the second one, I was done with firearms and armed robbery. Did you did you get caught like mid mid armed robbery? No, right? no, 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 no. Wasn't caught on an accident. Was arrested and it was set up by a uh, provo agent, a, a British agent. But then the provost fellow called George Points, notorious, and I had been across the border at this time. I came across the border and then look. To make a long story short, surrounded, hadn't a chance, and arrested. And then, but then, after five days interrogation, from which nothing was uh, gleaned whatsoever, I was just, again, the, the old conveyor belt system, and on the 23rd of December, or, I was a man in the back and cussed the criminal road jail. And then began a whole new uh, chapter or era in the history of our struggle that's culminated at that time in the hunger strikes in which we lost 10 men and on the first one where I along with Brandon Cuse, Sean McKenna and uh, Amy McCartney Leo Green and uh, Tom McFeely and those we, we, we were there to, this was a, a hunger strike to the death and um sorry can, can I take it back to um you 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 first getting into okay for, for the second sentence of the sentence of course um how, how long uh did did you did you uh did you start being on the blanket straight away when, yeah. when... oh uh, yeah the blanket when the ruddy men on the blanket when I went on, I was sentenced 14 years in September 1977. Okay, so um, the special category discussed with gone, but yeah. I was gone. The haste blocks was up now, and the haste blocks struggle was on, and the blanket struggle was on, the blanket protest was on, and 
and he, but I'm, I'm going to go in this more maybe later on with you. Is that okay? Maybe I don't know. So you made him because that is quite significant. And what happened there, it changed the whole course of the struggle and has led us to where we are today. Believe it not, the status quo, where you have Republicans up in Stormont, you have the a massive confidence within the Republican and Nazis communities. And you had the rise of Sinn Féin and both North and South. And all this here is the culmination of a lot of pain and suffering which we had went through on the haste blocks, the dirt, uh, no wash protests. Don't like calling it dirty protests. It's called a no wash protest because we we couldn't get out to wash. We were getting beat and we, had, we didn't shave then. And so on. You, see, you probably would have seen a lot of the... If you do watch H3, it's a good uh, film. If you watch Hunger, 60 Days, that'll give you an insight into life in the haste blocks. And again, now we're entering into a whole new phase of the struggle when the politicisation of the struggle began and the fight against what was called the uh, criminalisation. Yeah, yeah, this by especially by the social regime, protected by Ari Nave, who the NLA assassinated. I think it was 1976 or June 1976. And and bear in mind too that three of my comrades, four of them, were was assassinated by British undercover. And you had Miriam Daly, you had Ronnie Bunting. No little and um, John uh, was not a man down on them, but anyway, they were all assassinated by, 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 undercover, by undercover British agents. He said, undercover British agents and in collaboration with loyalists, you know, a bit like the Finucan thing, you know what I mean, right? Right, but like the, you know, the Finucan thing. So, but they, these were all our top members, our important members, especially Miriam Daly. And, so we we've added into a whole new phase of things, you know. But I mean, the last things I, I I you're gonna have to fill in all the gaps, sir. Uh, for example, uh, it was a feud, and because of the split in nineteen seventy four, a feud resulted, which a lot of uh, in which many men were wounded, NLA and a festival array between themselves, you know, between the old comrades, old friends. Families divided and everything else now. Uh, for example, you had the command officer of the official IRA in Belfast, a lifelong member called McMill. He was assassinated by NLA. And they, not so long before, these were all comrades. So, so many things have happened which were not good, and other things uh, were a stepping stone towards where we are today and maybe I, I, I would like to maybe if you agree uh, to talk about that particular period another time that's grand that, that's no problem um we, we, remind me when it was that there was a okay th there was obviously the INLA an official IRA few but but then there was yeah, the, it, it happened in December 1970 December January 1974 you can check all the papers about that there, and the, and I was going to ask it then there was um there was one with the IPLO too Did, could, could you remember off the top of your head when that, that, was? that was that that was a much different thing altogether that was many many years later and was the IPLO wasn't formed until the 1986 or something 85 you know it was that was not a step within the NLA and and they were only a small faction of people that and they were they were uh, they suffered the night of the long knives at the hands of the professionals at IPLO. They became involved in a lot of criminality. You understand? And so on. Hey, but that was a different thing altogether. I mean if you get if you do get a book read a book called Deadly Divisions, it's all about the history of the NLA, Deadly Divisions. Can't remember. I know. I know the author well, and uh, that will give you a, a insight of to what the NLA really were about. Did, did you um? Did, did you say you you you'd rather you'd rather talk about the the the, the various protests and the hunger strike at, at a different? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and that that's a whole new phase chapter in itself. 
what I'm talking about, my, my initial involvement and how, how that came about, the result of all the troubles, the, the, the civil rights marches, people's democracy marches, they were the most radical group, the people's democracy had a big influence here in Armagh, and they also had a big influence on me, and they introduced me to working class, Irish working class politics in a big way. And it was the beginnings, it was the embryo stages of my political involvement, the military involvement. And you know, there's a lot of gaps in there where you could fill in. Um, I need to sit down and think about it a bit more. It's only when I'm talking to myself to remember a lot of things. No, you're grand, you're grand. You know, about uh, some of the INLA operations <laughs> that were carried out because they're well known now, of course, you know. And for example, you know, after Ari Neve had been assassinated. Uh, I had been blamed for, uh, how would you say, advocating a this man would have to be taken out. And yet the reality was that when the operation was carried out, this is the reality. Everybody thought the promos had done it. Hmm. But maybe three or four hours later, it was claimed by the NLA and so on. But that was, these were all, um, we're getting back to the prestige targets again but of the NLA. Okay, cool. So so, so next time, uh, ne next time we, we can go over the, your, your, yeah. your, sec your <laughs> second period in Lankesh and, and these, these kind of, these INLA operations that, that you are free to talk about. Yes. Perfect. Okay. And, and, and again, the struggle. You can watch any of the, the hunger strike, you no know, films. Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually haven't seen I haven't seen the one with Michael Fassbender. I haven't seen Hunger. Oh, that in the, the 60 days. Was he the black fella? Is he not called Steve McQueen or something like that there? Yeah, he was the director, yeah. He was the director. Yeah, Steve McQueen. Well, that, right. was, that, was, that, was, that was the closest uh, ever. I Of all the films I've seen, and I don't like watch them because it's still very raw and it's still very emotional to me. It's still very, oh, you know, uh, it still impacts um, uh, all of us in many ways but some people like myself more than more than most because I was very closely involved with the hunger strikers yeah. all of them and uh, all I can say is yeah and we deserve a sort of thing and stuff but we're going back to what was happening both inside and outside and how the chains got it how the wheels and the cogs started to turn that left us with the machinery we have today